It's an honor to be here with you guys today, um, all the way up from the North Shore. It was an early morning trek. Thankfully, my adopted daughter, Mele, drove me here this morning. Um, it is a privilege to be with you guys, and I, Rick called me during the Christmas break, and he said, Sarah, will you speak on the 15th? And I was like, I'm not even sure if I'll be home on the 15th. Um, and he's like, I'm going to be traveling, and I'd love for you to come and just share your story. And I thought, okay, cool, yeah, that's a great opportunity. I want to thank you for that song you wrote this morning, by the way. Such a beautiful song. And um, just an encouragement as you shared that your mom was battling cancer and now is cancer-free. And we all were just drawn to applause for her, right? Because there's something about a comeback story that's just so encouraging to us. I get a lot of opportunities to travel and speak to people on all different spectrums. I also get an opportunity to work with um, victims of traumatic amputees. And what I do with them is I help them find uh, just a platform for their stories so that they can use their stories to inspire others. Because, you know, in the midst of the things that we suffer and we go through, there's these amazing comeback stories through our trials and our sufferings. And I think we can all attest to the fact that we love comeback stories, you know. We go into the movies and we see a movie based on a true story and we get inspired by those stories. Has that happened to you guys? Have you ever watched a movie? I, I remember the... Um, the Blind Side. That movie was so good and so inspiring, I thought I could play football by the end of it. <laughs> but we get inspired by these stories, and, and, and they, they change us, they touch our lives, and, and they also tend to make us want to do something with that story, to go out and to inspire others. Um, a lot of the, the things I went through in my own life, um, I now know that God was using that writing my story to, to make it a comeback story to inspire others. At a young age, my earliest memories of my father were that of him abusing me. Um, and that was a really hard thing to deal with because he had five kids, and of his five kids, I received the brunt of his addiction, you know, addicted to drugs and alcohol. And, you know, you begin to feel rejected. You were rejected by your parent, and you almost place that rejection upon the Lord. But if God was a God of love, where was he in this? And, and why wasn't he there for me? And so I kind of walked through many years of my life just kind of feeling that rejection. And um, I had faced a lot of illnesses growing up. I had to have a lot of surgeries. And it just seemed uh, that there was a lot of difficulty, a repetitiveness of difficulty in my life. Um, my mom faced cancer. And, you know, all, all, all these different things that I had to endure. And so for me... Uh, God didn't really fit in my story. He didn't fit in my life. My mom would make me go to church, but I just, I kind of rejected God. And I know that's the case for a lot of us when we go through sufferings and we go through hardships, we start to question, like, where is the Lord in this? Where is his plan? How can a God of love, how can a good God allow bad things to happen? So my identity became my sports. I played water polo, swam on the swim team, um, surfed. I just, I was a water baby. I just loved the ocean. I loved all things water. And I was able to excel at the sport of water polo so much so that I received a scholarship to play in college. And so my life was set. I had my plan. I'm going off to college. I'm going to play water polo, and I'm just so ready to go. And two weeks before I was to start water polo um, at school, I got in a surfing accident, and I ended up breaking my neck and my back. I was one sixteenth of an inch from being paralyzed. I went 30 hours without the doctors recognizing that my neck was broken. And I remember just laying in the hospital bed, just defeated, just so lost and so down and so destroyed. And I thought, man, what am I going to do now? And I began questioning, what am I here for? You know, in the midst of suffering and difficulty, we start to think like, God, do you really have a plan for my life? Am I really supposed to be here or am I a mistake? You messed up here. And I remember just one day being um, in my hospital bed and depression had really set in. I was laying in my bed alone and I just felt like if this is the best life that God has to give, I don't want to live this life anymore. And I had this moment with the Lord where I just said, if you're real and you're here, then I need you to speak to me. And all of a sudden, the room went dark and the lights shone forth. No, I'm just kidding, that didn't happen. <laughs> I know, you guys are all like, whoa, this is the best comeback story ever. But my mom would leave a Bible by my bedside on a regular basis, and so I remember just simply saying, if you're here, I need you to speak to me. 
And I opened up the Bible to 2 Corinthians. I, I didn't know what I was opening. I just opened it. And there was one verse in red writing, 2 Corinthians chapter, or sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. The next verse, Paul goes on to say, therefore, most gladly, I'd rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I take pleasure in needs and uh, distresses and persecutions for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And the Lord began to speak to my heart, just saying, you know, Sarah, yes, life has been difficult, but I've never allowed you to go through something you couldn't overcome. You see, the Bible says that we're pressed, but we're not crushed. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. God does not allow us to go through things that we cannot bounce back from. And the Lord just began speaking to my heart that if you give your life to me, I will bring purpose to the things you've gone through. Somehow in our lives, it's, we feel like in the midst of our suffering, like if, if God can bring purpose to it, it almost makes the suffering not so bad. And this is where my comeback story became uh, just the, the desire for God to use the things I had gone through. My motto in life has become that if you can find purpose in the pain, then the pain is worth it. For any of us in the midst of our own comeback story tonight, today, we might just feel ourselves just struck or stuck in this pain or in, in weakness or in bondage. And maybe your story is still being unfolded and you're just not sure where God's taking you or what God has for you. You might be facing something like homelessness, rejection, temptation, discouragement, betrayal, suffering, whatever you're going through. And maybe in the midst of your story today, you need to hear a good comeback story just to find the motivation to keep going. The greatest comeback story that you and I will ever hear or know about is that of Jesus himself. The Bible tells us that he went through every suffering. He can, is acquainted with all of our ways. We know that Jesus faced homelessness. In Matthew 8, 20, it says, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus faced rejection of people. Luke 17, 25 says, But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Jesus faced temptation at the hand of Satan himself, which is far greater temptation than anything I've ever struggled with. Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes up from the mouth of God. Jesus faced discouragement. Hebrews 5, 7 says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because his reverent submission. Jesus faced betrayal, as we know. In uh, Luke 22, we talk, talks about Judas betraying him. Jesus faced sufferings, Matthew 27, 26. Then he was released to the Barabbas, and the scorching of Jesus and delivered him to be crucified. And we all know the immense suffering that Jesus went through at the cross. You see, if we're asking today the question why in this life, I tell you something right now, that question why will never be answered. Throughout scripture, we aren't given the whys. We are told that we will suffer in this life, but God gives Beautiful, the beautiful message in the midst of our sufferings in Matthew 10, 29, where he says, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. The question why, why would the sparrow fall? It doesn't tell us if the sparrow was flicked out of the tree or if the sparrow was blown out of the tree. It doesn't tell us the why. Why did this happen to me? Why was I born like this? And you fill in the why blank for whatever you're going through today. Jesus is fully aware of our desire to know the why. Suppose Jesus were to tell us the why and the worst things that happen. Will the why make pain any less bearable? 
Does why fix the broken heart? Does why change the outcome of our circumstances? There are, I trust, good answers to the why for what we go through, but the scriptures just don't give us the why. The question really isn't easily answered because it isn't the right question that we should be asking in our lives. See, God here redirects the question from why to who. Who is present with us when bad things happen? None of us suffer alone. None of us face what we face without the Father's care. Not one sparrow falls to the ground without your heavenly Father knowing it's going to happen. God's saying that his presence is enough even in our deepest pain. And instead of asking why, we should just ask for God to be with us in the midst of suffering. It's not about the why, it's about the who. When we deflect from the why in our lives and we reflect on the who, our lives will become a beacon that God would use to transform the world. When we see the who, we find comfort. And when we aren't looking at the why, we will see the end, in the end, the greatest overcoming story known to man. The one that suffered in all things we suffer, but conquered Satan's sin and death and allowed us to become overcomers and the thing that we have to look forward to is eternity with him. I love that, that the greatest comeback story God is writing in and through us. Our story is a reflection of him. We're here to be beacons of his light and his glory to others in the midst of what they're going through. As we walk our comeback stories, God is at work in bringing beauty to our ashes and purpose to our pain. And when I stopped asking why in my own life, the who took control and started me on a journey of walking out the purpose of my pain. And that journey led me to a rock in the middle of the Pacific 15 years ago where I began to minister to young people who were facing pains and struggles and abuses and heartache. And because I could comprehend what they were going through, God said, here's just a little beacon of light to love these kids in the midst of their suffering. And what God has done through that suffering has blown me away. I still go through hard times, we all do, right? The Bible promises us we'll face hardships in this life. But the pain's always worth it because there's purpose in it. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, it says, Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, God has a funny way of working things out in our, in our lives. I shared with you the beginning of my story, just some of the abuse I faced at the hand of my father. And in the midst of God calling me to ministry here on Kauai, it was something I really struggled with still. And the Lord just called me to forgive my father. Not because he deserved it or he had asked for it, but because God had forgiven me so much. And God calls us to be forgivers of others. And so I remember I, I wrote my dad, who was in prison at the time, a letter and just said, hey, I want you to know I forgive you, not because you deserve it, but because God's great love has been given, given me an access to be forgiven and also the ability to forgive you. I didn't hear from my dad for 10 years. That was a heavy thing to carry that 10 years of still pain. You almost felt like you gave him an opportunity to hurt you more. But God began working in my heart in those 10 years that not to just forgive in word, that's an easy thing to do, but to forgive in deed. To be able to uh, learn what it is to show grace upon grace, and there's no greater ministry to learn about grace than youth ministry. <laughs> You got to give grace all day long. Those grace cards are just flying out of your pockets. But about six years ago, I received a phone call from, uh, I think it was a collect call, actually. 
<laughs> and it was Bill Hill on the other line. And it was my dad. And he was broken and he was crying. And he began saying, you know, Sarah, I, 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 I was in a halfway house and I got kicked out and all these excuses. And I just said, Dad, when are you going to give your heart to the Lord? When is he going to be enough for you that you flee the things of this world and you cling to God? And I challenged my dad to give his heart to the Lord and to make right his life for God. And I really didn't have a whole lot of faith that he would do so. If any of you have dealt with addiction, you know that you kind of, you know God can heal, but you kind of struggle with, is he really going to? And my dad ended up giving his heart to the Lord. I was able to fly out a month later to the mainland and meet him. He was a homeless man. I would have passed him as I did any other homeless person because of the effect and the toll that the drugs and alcohol had taken on his life. But God's great grace was right there with my father. And my dad gave his heart to the Lord, and for the last five years of his life, he lived a sober man, speaking into the lives of others about their addictions, and that God is the only thing that can set them free from that. My dad passed away a little over a year ago. He was hit by a car, and um, he lived for three months in the hospital. And even in those three months in the hospital, God used that time to speak his love to all the doctors and nurses and to my siblings that had never had a right relationship with my dad. You see, God was writing, even in the hospital, a comeback story that would transform all of our lives. And so I share that in closing with you guys because it's a great comeback story. That God, for 40 years, still loved my dad, no matter what you've done or where you've been or how long in the wilderness you've been, God still has a comeback story for you. He has not rejected you. He has not forgotten you. He loves you so much, and he has a plan for you. And so, you know, in the midst of the sufferings or the things you've gone through, and even if you're not suffering anything today, maybe you don't know what the purpose of your life is. For some of you that are older, you might think, okay, Lord, I've lived long enough. Let's skip the hard, you know, the barely being able to walk and just take me home. But God has you here for a reason. No matter your age, there's a purpose and a plan for you. And so I just want to encourage you, church, with that. Um, as Jeremy shared, uh, I've recently accepted a position to come on board with KCF. Rick's been trying to get me for years. I've been on Ka Kauai for 15 years, and I can't even imagine, I can't even tell you the number of times he's tried to get me to the south side. Um, and I love the south side. This is not a war between south and north. Um, but you have great people here and great leaders leading your youth. And God had specifically called me to the North Shore to work with youth. And so now that there's a KCF North, I get to be a part of the both teams. It's the best thing ever. So, <laughs> thank you. I look forward to sharing more um, with you guys in, in due time, and I just thank you for taking the time to hear my story, and I just hope that you're inspired this morning. Uh, church doesn't have to necessarily just be a pastor speaking to you, but it can be a comeback story of, of what God can do in and through all of our lives. Let's close in prayer. God, we just come before you. We thank you so much for your comeback story. We thank you that um, in the midst of our suffering, I think we forget that you have faced everything we've faced and beyond. And yet you finished strong, enduring the cross, so that you could give us the greatest freedom through your Son that we've ever had, eternity in Christ with you through faith in Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray for anyone that's discouraged or uh, maybe just still dealing with heartache, that they would just trust that to you and trust that you are going to bring purpose to whatever they're facing, Lord. We just love you. We pray that you bless this body today. In your name, amen. Thank you, guys. You guys are dismissed.